Look at all the. All right. Uh, good, good afternoon, everybody. It's uh, great to be in uh, Lisbon. I just landed here about 45 minutes ago, uh, so uh, really excited to be with everyone. So very, very excited for today's panel. Uh, obviously, uh, the, the people in this room are, are building uh, Web3. Uh, they're building a decentralized future. And my colleagues on stage, who will ask to introduce themselves in a moment, are the absolute top experts. And not only, they're not just sitting in ivory towers, they're in the trenches working with the builders on the one side and with the policy makers, the stakeholders, the regulators, the legislators, you know, literally around the world to help pave the way for what we're all trying to build. Um, so my name is Jeff Banman. Uh, in a prior life, I was a senior official at a regulator, the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, where I started up uh, blockchain and virtual currency work after we testified to Congress that we thought virtual currencies were a commodity. Uh, currently, I am the uh, COO and general counsel of the 6529 group. I work with a pseudonymous uh, thought leader called Punk6529, who's a great advocate for uh, open metaverse, uh, that are Web3 better than Web2, as well as uh, working on NFTs, collecting, investing as a thought leader. So I'll ask my incredibly talented panel to introduce our, themselves, and then we'll jump in, starting with Kristen. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Kristen Smith. I'm the, or I guess afternoon, I'm in the wrong time zone as well, Jeff. Um, my name is Kristen Smith. I am the executive director of the Blockchain Association, which is a US-based trade organization for companies who are building um, in the cryptocurrency industry. And we, we focus on primarily US policy, um, a little bit of international work as well. Uh, but our goal is to ensure that we have uh, the good regulation that doesn't harm uh, the innovation for everything you all are doing in this room. Hello, everybody. Great to be here. Uh, my name is Kurt Opsal. I'm with the Electronic Frontier Foundation, a nonprofit organization that is dedicated to defending your rights online. We try to fight for privacy, free expression, innovation, trying to build a future that we would want to live in so we can move forward into the digital age into a better future. Take what we have today and make it better tomorrow. Thanks. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Veronica McGregor. I'm the uh, I'm currently the chief legal officer at Exodus, which is uh, an amazing self custody wallet. Prior to this, I was chief legal officer at Shapeshift, and I oversaw their full de decentralization into a DAO from a from a centralized entity. Before that, I was the partner at law firms. So that's not very interesting. Marta? Hi, I'm Marta Belcher. I am the president and chair of the Filecoin Foundation. I'm also the general counsel and head of policy at Protocol Labs. Uh, and I also serve as special counsel to the Electronic Frontier Foundation. And very excited to have this amazing group of people here uh, to talk all about policy. Great, great. Well, as you can see, just an absolute uh, powerhouse lineup here. So why don't we uh, get started? And, and Kurt, maybe I'll turn to you first about this. Um, you know, uh, a few months ago, uh, the world heard of something called Tornado Cash. Some people already knew about it and used it, but then uh, an action was brought against uh, tor Tornado Cash that has, you know, gotten a lot of people concerned. Uh, there's actually started to be some litigation about it. Kurt, could you explain to us what this is and what some of the challenges and issues are around this? Absolutely. So uh, in early August, uh, Tornado Cash, was placed on the uh, specially designated nationals list by the Office of Financial Assets Control, or OFAC. Uh, and this is a strange thing, because that is a list that is ordinarily people. Uh, sometimes it is their property, so you'll see like boats on that list from like the oligarchs. But this was a case of software being placed on there. The Tornado Cash Mixer. A mixer is a program that probably many of you are familiar with, but it tries to solve some of the problems with uh, public blockchains where your financial transactions are uh, connected to a wallet, and if your wallet is ever identified with you, someone can look back on the history of what was done with that wallet and see all your financial transactions, and that can be a very uh, you know, exposing experience. And so the mixer tried to, to solve for that, uh, and then OFAC came in and put it on this sanctioned list, and if you're on the sanctions list, people are not supposed to do any sort of business with you. So what was put on there? That was a little ambiguous. They named the software project, they named a website, they put some uh, wallets, which are at least more specific, but there really isn't an entity called Tornado Cash. Tornado Cash is both a software project, it's a DAO, it's a website. 
So what was being sanctioned? Well, one of the things that first came out from this is GitHub removed the canonical source code from their repository. And this came out to, to EFF as a core issue because it was taking down speech. T code is speech. And this is very important because code is a way you can express yourself. You can express political ideas, social ideas through code, and then the code was being taken down. Now, in this case, it was a privacy idea. And privacy is not just a fundamental right, but it's a fundamental right that enables other rights. So the books that you buy, the videos that you watch, these are private transactions that you might want to protect because that's also part of how you receive information and form your ideas. It can effectuate your rights when you're supporting political organizations, nonprofit organizations, putting out your ideas and trying to effectuate them in the world. And you can need that privacy as well to exercise your rights by getting a, like abortion services. So it is a fundamental right, and we need privacy-enhancing software in order to protect and preserve that right. And it's not just mixers. We have things like messaging software, encrypted messaging software, or anonymous web browsers. Uh, that these kinds of technologies are critical to preserving these rights. And in many cases, and this is why it's particularly important, these are open source projects. And without the protections afforded to uh, code as speech, you have potentially have the chilling effect where persons who are part of that community that is making the software might get chilled from contributing to it by participating in that for fear that if that software is later misused for something unlawful, that they will be held liable. So that's why we need these protections. People can develop that code and maybe even solve some of these problems. Find a way to see if somebody's on the sanctioned list. Maybe use a zero knowledge proof that only tells that information so they can still have privacy in their transactions and solve a sanction problem. But you can't get that unless you can continue to develop the software. That's great. Marta, did you want to comment as well? Sure, I mean, I would add to what Kurt said about the tornado cash um, incident. Um, to, I would say that one of the things that is so unfortunate about what OFAC is doing here is that they're fundamentally taking the position that a software tool that makes it possible to make transactions privately is illegal, that it's suddenly illegal for Americans to use that software tool simply because it enables private transactions. And this is something that I think is really something that we as the cryptocurrency community should be pushing back against because this is definitely not the first time that we've seen the United States government or other governments around the world taking the position that these types of protocols that actually enable privacy or anonymity um, are uh, bad or illegal. But to be clear, privacy and anonymous transactions are not illegal, they're not bad, they're absolutely essential for civil liberties. And for some reason, I think in the United States and around the world, we've just sort of come to accept that our financial transactions in the traditional banking system are surveilled, that they get turned over to the government by default without a warrant, um, just as part of the, a matter of course. But this is really not what I think we should accept as a standard. Um, in the United States, for example, under the Fourth Amendment, in order for the government to get information, uh, they need to actually get a warrant and have probable cause. But for some reason with financial transactions, that's not what happens. What we really essentially have is a system of mass surveillance where our financial transactions are getting turned over to the government by default. And I think we've come to accept that. And so what we're seeing is this moment in time where governments are, and Tornado Cash is a great example of this, starting to take the uh, position that these, the financial surveillance of the traditional banking system should be extended to cryptocurrency. And obviously for us in the cryptocurrency space, that's really um, anathema to our core values, to the whole point of why we created these technologies in the first place. So I think we're really at this inflection point where we can start questioning not just should this mass surveillance of the financial system be um, uh, extended to the cryptocurrency world, but should we accept the mass surveillance of the traditional financial system as it exists today, uh, as it is. And so I think it's really an interesting inflection point, and I think it's really coming to a head with what we're seeing with Tornado Cash. So, so one of the uh, interesting things that's happened in the aftermath of Tornado Cash, obviously, of criticism, thought leadership, lawsuits, 
um, um, you know, uh, amicus briefs and whatnot. So after this happened, maybe a week or two later, some anonymous person uh, using Tornado Cash sent what people generally call dust, uh, which is very, very, very small amounts of Ethereum to a lot of publicly known people's wallets, like celebrities. And you know, this is because of the unusual transparency, for example, in NFTs that you know, you know which wallet Ashton Kutcher has because you know he has an eight, et cetera. So you know, to loads of people got these transmissions from Tornado Cash, so all of a sudden they're on the OFAC list, they're getting caught off from their accounts at OpenSea and Coinbase. So I think it's kind of whoever did this was quite uh, imaginative in really trying to drive home the, the, uh, the impacts of that and you know, probably had a wicked sense of humor, although if you were a receiver, you didn't necessarily think it was so, uh, so funny. Um, well, keep, keeping our eyes on the U.S. and the actions uh, in the U.S., Kristen, um, there's been, uh, it seems like there's been more activity than usual in uh, Congress and in the Senate uh, around potential legislation, you know, more, more hearings. Um, do you think that uh, there's some likelihood that there will be U.S. legislation even as soon as this year on um, stable coins or on assigning allocation for the spot crypto market? Uh, yeah, no, there is a tremendous amount of legislative discussion going on in Washington right now. Um, D.C. is a little bit behind where Europe is. Europe has moved forward uh, with Mika, and that, that process is underway right now. But um, in the United States, the bill that is getting the most attention is called the Digital Commodities. Consumer Protection Act, or the DCCPA. And the bill started as something that was really supposed to focus on coming up with a, a designating a spot market regulator um, for centralized crypto exchanges. But the way it was drafted and introduced, uh, the definitions of the types of entities that would be captured, these, these things called uh, digital commodity platforms, and in, in particular, digital commodity trading facilities, the definitions were written in a way that are so broad that it captures all of DeFi, and DeFi would therefore have to comply with the same regulations as a centralized exchange. Obviously, this doesn't make sense. Um, it you know, should probably not have any regulation at this stage. I mean, I think it, what, what Europe did with coming up with sort of a four-year plan to study it and think about it is, is probably the right approach. But uh, there has been a lot of momentum behind this bill. Um, I think there is a divide in the crypto community in, in the U.S. right now between those that are trying to build the new web and build new financial infrastructure and those who want to see essentially a Bitcoin ETF and know that they need regulations in order to get that. So a little bit of um, internal fighting, but I think um, there was a wonderful debate that happened um, really over Twitter and through podcasts over the past week and a half, um, sort of culminating in a, in a great um, a great debate from Sam Bankman Fried at FTX and Eric Voorhees at Shapeshift that really, I think, sort of drove home, um, you know, the differing um, op opinions. Um, but but they've been, you know, coming out in a fairly thoughtful and analytical way. So I think that this um, attention that the crypto community has been giving to regulation is probably enough that the bill's chances of actually becoming law are, are fairly slim this year. I would put it, you know, less than 5% right now, maybe maybe even 1%. But um, definitely a lot of attention and something that I think we'll see the new Congress after, after the elections uh, pick up and, and move forward in 2023. All right. So we'll clearly need to, to, to watch the space. But, uh, you know, maybe, maybe this won't happen this year in the lame duck session. But... You know, because we'll see what the makeup of Congress is, and uh, you know where where we go from uh, from there. Uh, I'm going to come back to you, uh, Kristen, before turning to uh, Veronica, who's been waiting, you know, very patiently. Um, the uh, there was a recent uh, CFTC enforcement action, my alma mater, against a platform called B Zero X LLC, which uh, people haven't really heard of, but it's known more commonly as uh, Uki Dow. Uh, these were people who uh, set up a, a trading platform. The fact pattern was a little bit like a recent BitMEX enforcement action uh, where they had, you know, the CFTC went after them for having an unlicensed trading platform that needed to be registered. Um, so if that had been all that happened, you know, it probably wouldn't have gotten too much attention. 
But in fact, you know, UkiDAO has become much more of a kind of household name to people in the space. Why is that, and you know, what, what is concerning you about it? Yeah, no, well, maybe even before I get in that, to, to sort of back up where things are in the U.S. right now, you know, the federal agencies have given all of the guidance that they can comfortably give um, for regulation. Uh, what, where we're at now is the stage where we probably need Congress to come in and pass some reasonable legislation to fill in the gaps on spot markets, stable coins, et cetera. Um, but in the meantime, agencies, and we saw this with Tornado Cash and we're seeing it with UkiDAO, are testing how much authority they have by bringing enforcement actions. And I don't think that this regulation by enforcement approach is the right way to make policy, but the reality is it's happening and um, I'm happy to see the community fighting back and, um, you know, forcing these actions to go to, to trial. What's interesting about UkiDAO is uh, there were really sort of two announcements. B0X, which was a centralized, uh, well, even before that, in the United States, if you are trading margin products, you have to be registered with the CFTC, very clear. There's no getting around that. That's why DYDX, you know, geofences the US, et cetera. Um, what happened is B0X um, did a, a settlement with the CFTC because they created a product that did this without registering with the CFTC. And in an effort to get out of the regulation, they decentralized the network. They turned it into a DAO called UkiDAO. And what was interesting about this is the CFTC said if you were a governance token holder who voted on anything related to UkiDAO at any given time, that you were personally liable for failing to register at the CFTC. And it's complicated, right? Because how do you know who was participating in the DAO, where, where they name, where, what their names are, what their addresses are. And so, yeah, they've been serving people through chat bots and doing all sorts of interesting things. But, you know, this is really the first time we've seen the CFTC take this regulation by enforcement approach. And this is obviously clearly new grounds, new policy, and um, something that, um, you know, I think is, it will be interesting to watch it play out because um, it could it could have a chilling effect in the United States around you know participation in DAOs. Yeah, it's interesting. Like I've seen a lot of uh, you know people kind of thinking about it because um, you know it was a bit of a novel of uh, legal theory. Uh, one of the commissioners, Summer Mersinger, wrote a you know fairly blistering dissent that's worth reading for those of you who want to dig into the weeds. But you know one of the things I've seen is that uh, you know. Entities that hold interests in DAOs are sort of thinking, wait a second, I might not have been, been active in the governance, and I could suddenly have some sort of liability, some regulatory liability, some other liability. Uh, you know, not legal advice, but I've seen people like start to put their holdings in DAOs into SPVs just to have a, a blocker, and you know, that's and, and some of them are even moving them offshore. So, you know, I think for kind of a small case about an exchange no one ever heard of, you know, I think it, it's it's been a catalyst for. Um, you know, a lot of thinking about, you know, what are the, you know, at, at a stage where we're really very early and, you know, should be probably promoting best practices and thinking around, you know, how good, good DAO governance should, should work. Um, all right, so turning to, to Veronica, thanks, uh, thanks so much. So, uh, so many t topics, but one, uh, as we were talking about before, you know, since we're in, in Europe and your business is very, have, have a global uh, outlook from this and your prior experiences, uh, Europe uh, recently enacted a, a whole digital finance package uh, for crypto, a kind of the centerpiece of which is called uh, Mika. It's Mika in Europe, not Mika. In the US, we call it Mika here. Yeah. All my um, Euro friends say Mika. Yeah. So, so what, what, what is that, and you know, what's your assessment of that, and what the impact is going to have potentially in Europe and maybe the rest of the world? Yeah. Um, so, so Mika, Mika um, <laughs> has a lot. You know, there's a lot to unpack there. Um, but we have a lot of time to unpack it, not here on this stage, but um, you know, they still have to write the regulations, and each, and each of the member states of the EU are going to have to um, adopt it and put, like, essentially put, put their spin on it as, uh, you know, that they can still make their own uh, rules in, uh, in, in terms of making the regulation. Um, it's primarily aimed at, like, stable coins and exchanges, um, not so much, you know, like the Filecoin system necessarily, but there is this um, little requirement that may not be such a little requirement that that um, 
you know, tokens slash coins go through, you know, produce a white paper about themselves and it has to be approved. Um, so there could be an issue, I guess, depending on how, how Filecoin is, is uh, received in terms of its white paper and how, how you know, what, what the various um, regulations that end up coming out, uh, you know, we, there's really no framework yet for what that review would look like on the white paper. Um, and it's, you know, Mika is, it is, uh, you know, inevitable in one way or another, but it is also not tomorrow because all the regulations still have to be, um, have to be, you know, written. Um, and then uh, there's another, there's this uh, transfer of funds rule that also got um, passed that is kind of like, uh, it's got sort of a travel rule. You know, we've all heard of FATF's travel rule and FinCEN's travel rule um, component where you're, you're expected during a transfer funds to send with the funds, um, you know, a type, some pieces of information, data that, that we don't typically collect um, when we're just moving, uh, you know, transactions across the chains. So um, there's, a, there's a privacy concern there, obviously, um, because those are not information we typically would, you know, that's kind of sort of <laughs> complete enough, another anathema to, to what blockchain uh, and crypto transactions are about, is we want less information moving around from place to place. But then that brings up some practical concerns because, the, you know, the way that the technology works, it doesn't currently uh, permit that gathering and transfer that information. Uh, and then there's a security question about if, if you have that information and it moves around, who's in charge of making sure it's, it's secure and all that stuff. So that, but that is a rule. The, the sort of travel rule um, has been around for a while, long enough that there are now there are third party vendors um, who can try and help with compliance with that. The question is not like, are, is it, you know, we could find a way to comply, I guess, but it's more of a, on a philosophical level, you know, like that just feels wrong. It's our, you know, so it's again, it's kind of like, you know, the various, it's kind of like Tornado Cash, which has a lot of practical implications too, which are even, how do you, for example, as a self-custody wallet, and any of my, our users, we're supposed to keep their wallets from interacting with Tornado Cash, we, we can't even do that. So anyway, there's a lot of procedural things that are not, um, you know, that haven't been considered and practical things that haven't been considered in a lot of this legislation that's coming out. Yeah, and so, so um, cases. you know, with, uh, with Mika, and obviously there's still a little bit, you know, some work to do. They have to do the, uh, after the, the, you know, the pan-European regulation is passed, they have to do technical, second level, third level things. Yeah, what, what in Europe is called a regulation, in the U.S. we would call legislation, but it means it's binding across all the member states. Right. But they still have to work out a lot of the operational details, so there'll be little time. I mean, Veronica, sticking, sticking with this, do you think if other jurisdictions uh, you know, around the world, do you think that there's some likelihood that they'll follow e Europe's example? And if you do, do you think that's a kind of Yeah, I mean, I thing? hope not, but I, the reality is, is that, um, you know, all these jurisdictions talk to each other, right? Yeah. And there are some differences, both cultural and, and uh, you know, governmental differences between, say, the EU and the yeah. United States. The EU, though, has typically been very focused on, on consumer privacy, very focused on it. Maybe not the way we would all like them to be focused on it, but they have been protective of consumer privacy. The U.S. considerably less so. But so there will be cultural differences. Um, but, you know, in, in, in I don't expect, I expect that um, this type of regulation will eventually find its way around. Got it. And, uh, you know, Kristen alluded a couple moments ago, I know you mentioned when we were just chatting before, you know, kind of a, a Twitter thread that's taking place between two of the best known personalities in crypto, right? Sam Bankman-Fried and, and Eric Voorhees. So I know you formally worked with him. I don't want to drill into it. Is it, do you have any observations of it or have you been so busy you haven't had time to track I am it? staying out of the Eric <laughs> Sam uh, <laughs> thing. I'm staying right out of it. Eric is a really good friend of mine. I, but I'm not gonna, I'm Switzerland. <laughs> all right, so the beautiful thing about crypto Twitter is you can all read it yourselves and see the back and forth and all the, all the commentary. It's, uh, yeah, it's, it's a whole, you know, lively world of its own. Um, so, so Marta, um, you know, the, you know, we were saying it's, you know, you and I have been on, you know, I've had the pleasure of doing panel discussions with you for quite a number of years. I know you spend a ton of your time in, in Washington and other 
places around the world also engaging with policymakers. I'd say, you know, a few years ago, hardly anybody in government had even really necessarily heard of blockchain or, or digital assets, and if they did, they didn't know much about them. I can attest to that, because in 2014, 2015, the CFTC, very few regulators around the world knew anything. You know, now it's a subject of serious debate in the halls of, you know, uh, legislatures, uh, regulators around the world, there's tons of, of news coverage. Do you, do you feel like the understanding of crypto policy and kind of the implications has actually improved with all the effort that's being put in to you know, try to explain and, and convey these things to them, or does, does it get a little frustrating at times? Yeah, you know, I think that um, certainly over time, it's been unbelievable to see how um, crypto has gone from um, literally being completely unknown to almost all policymakers and regulators, other than you, Jeff, when you were back at the <laughs> CFTC and one of the few regulators who actually understood this stuff. Um, uh, to a to you know when I was testifying in in the Senate there were two other hearings on crypto happening at the same time by complete coincidence which is wild um, and um, a lot of the understanding of crypto has really been driven by uh, Kristen and the blockchain Association just doing amazing work um, to make policymakers understand um, what this technology is and why it's important um, what I would say is I think you know it is important that policymakers understand the space of course so that they don't uh, regulate it out of existence. Um, but I think that one of the things that's very tricky is that I think that there is this myth among policymakers, legislators, and the public that cryptocurrencies are unregulated um, and that we don't have legislation or regulation that applies to cryptocurrency and therefore that we need to rush in with these bills um, like the ones you're seeing here and try to regulate crypto because it's unregulated. And in reality, um, the cryptocurrency space is deeply regulated. So the on-ramps and the off-ramps where you're buying and selling and custodying cryptocurrency are chartered bank companies. Um, they're complying with the BSA. They're doing KYC. They're opening their doors for examinations. These are deeply regulated entities. Um, and I think that's not really well understood. And I think the other thing that's not really well understood is that what a lot of policymakers see is things like crypto scams or other areas where things are... Um, um, bad things are happening, but you know the reality is that fundamentally um, we don't we don't regulate technologies. We regulate activities, and the bad things that happen in the crypto space or any other space um, fundamentally are already illegal, right? If you're committing fraud, it doesn't matter whether you're committing fraud using a pen and paper or cryptocurrency or email or the telephone. The technology doesn't matter. It's already illegal to commit fraud, and you don't have to pass cryptocurrency-specific regulations in order to uh, protect consumers. You already have plenty of tools in your toolbox, and you know I think that we already sensibly do apply um, regulation to the cryptocurrency space. And so I think one of the problems in the space is really a lack of understanding and legislators feeling like they need to rush in and try to legislate here, when in reality this is already a really regulated space. Yeah, and, and, and Kurt, you know, kind of following up on uh, Mar Marta's ob observations, you know, all this work has gone into uh, you know, bringing this to the, the policymakers' attention. Um, you know, the, uh, you know, Bitcoin, in a way, you know, may have been allowed to grow um, as kind of the, the first because people thought, you know, it's not a big deal, you know, it's just a bunch of nerds with computer money, uh, you know. I sometimes think about kind of NFTs or, or you know, the, the same way in the sense that, you know, is this, you know, if the regulators just think it's a bunch of nerds, you know, playing with, pictures of monkeys, you know, maybe they'll just kind of leave it alone, hard to say. Do you think all this attention has, like, sort of helped the cause of, of Web3 and, and, you know, the, the issues you work on, or do you think it may have been actually counterproductive? Well, I, I think it's, a, there has been more attention to it, and this is, this is a story that's been around with technology for a long time. Technology start out in the you know, software engineers, computer engineers, nerd space, and then they become popularized and go to the, the, the general public. So, you know, when I started in this, there wasn't, uh, you know, uh, the, the web was something very brand new. People were trying to understand it. It became something like, now there's an IP address on your toaster. So these things become more important. So it makes sense that policy regulators will get there. But the challenge is that 
policymakers, lawmakers, and such, they're usually behind on where, where the technology is. And so that's very important for this community and for people working in this, speak tech to power, help educate them, help them understand how it works and why it's good, how it can be used for good. And so like, even if we're gonna have some policy disagreements, it's better that a legislature is, is understanding the technology and then you can talk about what the right policy is than making a policy that's based on a misunderstanding of the technology. So you say like, the attention drawn to it, I mean some of that attention has led to misconceptions and that's what, what we have to, by explaining it better and educating better, help them understand what's really going on and then make policy based on that. That's great, well thanks. And on, on that note, I see we're, we're out of time. There's obviously a lot more we could take, but you know, my colleagues here on stage are the people who are doing the very hard work around the world to make sure the key stakeholders uh, you know, do understand it, that they get around the misconceptions. So uh, please join me in giving them a big hand.